Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our meeting tonight of April the 24th. Uh, we like to start our council meetings off with the singing of O Canada. And we've got Mia. Is Mia here tonight? Oh, okay, Mia, do you want to come all the way around? And you can come up to the microphone here. Mia Bergamo, is that right? Yes, okay, so pick a mic. Is a little red light on? you got to make sure the little red light's on. Yes. It's on? Okay, thank you. Mia Bergamo. Uh, she's an ambitious, musical, grade six student. Mia attends St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Elementary School. She's passionate about music. She not only listens to all types of music, but she also enjoys singing. Mia's favorite band is the Beatles. Aside from music, Mia enjoys traveling with her family, hanging out with her friends, and playing with her dog, Poppy. Mia's future ambitions include traveling the world. She also plans on studying hard to become a child psychologist. Mia, welcome. We look forward to you singing. Yeah, that was terrific, and I've got to tell you, with your pause at the beginning, you had me a little bit nervous. <laughs> I wasn't sure what was going on, but I'm just glad you belted it out the way you did. You did a fantastic job. Congratulations. All right, thank you. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and I'm sorry. Could I get everyone to stand, please? Um, we'd like to, yeah. Uh, in light of the very sad events that have been happening recently and specifically most recently yesterday in Toronto, we'd like to offer a moment of silence for all the victims and the families that have been affected by this terrible incident. Thank you very much. Okay, the uh, first order of business is the adoption of the minutes from our 10th of April 2018 meeting. Moved by Councillor uh, Morocco, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Next up are disclosures of a pecuniary interest. And you'll see the municipal accounts was 7.3 on the agenda. Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. There is one made out to Niagara Catholic District School Board, my employer, 0144-0004, uh, and as well, there's a bylaw that just follows up on the, um, uh, on the I guess, uh, planning matter that I declared a conflict on last meeting that dealt with the accessory dwellings. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor uh, Cario. Thank you, Worship. On the item to do with transient accommodation tax, obviously it's one of the businesses I'm in, so I'm gonna declare conflict on that one. Okay, any other, uh, Councillor Thompson? 
Same, same for Councilor Thompson. Councilor Morocco. Kind of conflict with uh, the two dollars. <laughs> the transient tax, okay, right. as well. Okay, uh, Councilor uh, Greater. Uh, don't have a conflict on the transient okay, tax. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I do have one under municipal accounts. It's 413836 uh, for services, and it's payable. It's a check that's payable to myself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I've got a check payable to myself, check number 414179. So we'll start off with the most exciting part of the meeting, uh, the mayor's remarks. It'll be brief. Are we starting with that one? Yeah. Obituaries. Uh, we'd like to offer condolences for Elvira Marinelli, the grandmother of Anna Morocco, of our clerk's office. I'd like to thank Councillor Morocco, who represented the city at the Light of Day Parkinson's Benefit Concert, as well as the ES Fox Limited event, and Councillor Strange, for representing the city at the walk and greetings of DeSantos Martial Arts Student Ceremony. Announcements, the flags at City Hall were lowered and remain at half staff in honor of the 10 people who lost their lives and 15 others who were hospitalized after the tragic attack in Toronto on Young Street yesterday afternoon. We had the Paul Harris Award Symposium last weekend. I was joined by Councillors Morocco and Crater. We had a meeting with the President of the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, Mr. Zengui Jiang. I was joined by Councillor Morocco and as well I, I attended the Volunteer Firefighter Recognition Banquet, and I was joined by Councillors Crater, Strange, and Peter Angelo. Our next council meeting will be Tuesday, May the 8th. Moving on, first item 6.1, we've got Mr. Doug Burrell, CEO of Niagara Hospitality Hotels, <coughs> to speak about the transient accommodation tax. Welcome, Mr. Burrell. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Diodati and uh, members of council, and thank you for allowing me to address you on this issue of, of the new proposed hotel transient tax. My name is Doug Burrell, uh, a city resident and uh, proud member of the Niagara Falls tourist industry. Let me just make sure my presentation is gonna come up. Look at that skyline, beautiful. So the background has been explained in Mr. Todd's uh, report to you, and his uh, report provides a very good uh, synopsis. And his report states that the hotel industry has come together to provide a proposal to the city of Niagara Falls that would provide a mechanism to raise and administer funds for the purpose of promoting tourism and alleviate the city taxpayers from any further burden to fund tourism promotion from the city budget. So to give this some con context um, to this uh, background, I'd like you to ask yourselves why there's no national large corporate chain hotel developments in Niagara Falls. No Fairmont hotels. And the reason is simple. Niagara Falls is a very tough and challenging market for hotels. With its acute seasonality, short length of stay, the average length of stay here for anybody who stays in a hotel is 1.1 nights. It's very difficult to operate and very difficult to get a return on investment in this market. So the big national hotel companies can get a much easier return on investment in most other markets. This is compounded with the fact that hotels are generally a very tough and risky venture. They're capital intensive, they're labor intensive, and certainly not on the top of the list for the, for the lending community. So we are a unique industry in Niagara Falls. Operating a hotel in Niagara Falls isn't the same as operating a hotel in other parts of the world and other parts of Canada. All hotels in this city are owned and operated by local people who you know, self-made entrepreneurs with vision. That skyline shows you the vision that was created. The world-class hotels is a testament to that. These stakeholders are in their businesses daily providing the leadership and direction to make their businesses work in this challenging market. They are Niagara-centric, focused solely on growing Niagara businesses. Unlike other cities like Toronto, many of those hotels are owned by faceless REITs, real estate investment trusts, funds with diverse portfolios, so they might own a hotel in Toronto and a strip mall in Sudbury and a factory in Calgary, and the decisions are made in Bay, Bay Street. 
It's a radically different business model here. As an industry sector, the Niagara Falls hotel industry is the largest single employer and the largest single tax contributor. The average tax rate on one hotel room can exceed some residential property taxes. And I don't think many residents really appreciate the impact that these hotel property taxes have on their own property tax. If it wasn't for the hotel sector, certainly their rates would be much higher. <clears throat> I'll let the PowerPoint catch up to me. So, um, so we are proposing an industry-driven response to raising and managing funds for the sole purpose of tourist promotion. We're proposing that commencing January 1, 2019, the hotels and motels in the city of Niagara Falls, Ontario, will charge a flat rate transient hotel tax of $2 per occupied room. These funds will be collected by the city and 95% of the funds is given to a newly formed Niagara Falls Hotel Canada, sorry, Niagara Falls Canada Hotel and Motel Association to manage and dispense the funds for tourism promotion with an emphasis on destination marketing and tourism promotion initiatives at the discretion of this association. It's in fact a clearinghouse. The city will retain 5% of this tax is what we're proposing to cover the collection costs and the hotel association will work with the city to develop an easy and efficient reporting and collection me method for this, perhaps similar to how the HST is collected uh, from businesses. The hotel association will provide funding to tourism promotion and related agencies such as Niagara Falls Tourism, Winter Festival of Lights, with some specific objectives and criteria and will reserve the right to conduct some of their own collective member-driven campaigns and other tourism marketing and promotion activities based on member desires. There will also be a fund for major special events that promote the destination such as the Live with Kelly and, and Ryan show or big name entertainment for uh, New Year's Eve telecasts. Uh, there will be a percentage of the funds that is distributed back to the BIAs based on their contribution of tax funds. So to start this process, the funds should start to be dispensed to the respective agencies six months after collection, so after we know what we've got. So we start collecting on January 1, we start dispensing on July 1st. And the intention is to use these funds for tourism-related marketing and promotion, not capital or infrastructure. Also, it is not the intent for the fund to be used directly to fund the Scotiabank Convention Center, though the Fallsview BIA would certainly be at liberty to use its portion of the funds at its sole discretion, including funding Convention Center initiatives, as they do now. There will be total transparency and accountability with this process, a full audit of all of the association's revenue and disbursements provided to council and made public. The Niagara Falls Canada Hotel and Motel Association. Our mission is to strengthen the, the Niagara Falls hotel industry through leadership and member-driven advocacy and promote overnight tourism visitation to Niagara Falls, Canada. The membership <clears throat> is open to all hotels and motels within Niagara Falls, Canada, uh, and um, there will be a nominal fee to, to, to join this. Uh, all hotels will, of course, be legislated to charge and, uh, and remit the tax, but for those who want to have a voice, there will be a nominal uh, fee to join. This is typical of what other hotel associations are doing in Toronto and, and, and Ottawa. I'm suggesting here $3 per occupied room, but that is subject to uh, the hotel association uh, finally meeting and, and approving that. Our mandate is to provide a collective voice to address the needs of the hotel community within its boundaries, to promote the hotel and hospitality industry in Niagara, to foster goodwill and a better understanding of the Niagara hotel industry with the public, liaise with relevant tourism agencies to provide coordination and marketing objective direction liaise with various levels of government as required, to provide a platform to enable competing members to work together on issues of public policy that impact 
the industry, and raise the profile of the hotel sector as a vital component of the Niagara tourist industry. Gather and disseminate beneficial statistics and trends relevant to its members. Provide a resource for advocacy on issues affecting the hotel industry in Niagara, and provide a mechanism to pool financial resources and facilitate destination marketing programs as required. We have strong industry support for the plan that is presented. We have uh, uh, a formal approval from the three tourism uh, BIAs. All of the major multi-hotel owners have uh, endorsed uh, uh, this plan and most of the individual owners in the city. The Board of Directors will be a representation by population. We're suggesting 13 hoteliers will, will form this board. Five seats from the Falls v. BIA, as I say, representation by population. There's 4,404 rooms in that uh, part of the city, which is 36.3% of all of the, of the rooms. Uh, Lundy's Lane gets two seats. Uh, Victoria Avenue BIA gets two seats. These are all hoteliers representing, uh, being represented uh, on this board from those areas. Clifton Hill will get a seat and three seats uh, for the large section of those hoteliers that are not now in a, uh, currently in, in a BIA. So what we are proposing is that this, the, the city and the hotel association uh, uh, sign a five-year agreement. We, once we, if we get your approval in principle today, that would be the next step. And then, uh, but, but after three years, we all take a pause and we take a look, uh, hire consultants if necessary, and determine uh, the effectiveness of the plan and, and, and make any potential suggestions to see if it can be made uh, more effective. So the above represents the basic principles uh, that would be incorporated in this new hotel association charter subject to minor uh, uh, variances in full consultation with our lawyers to ensure that we meet the provincial uh, legislation's eligibility. So the expectation, the goal, what do we get out of this? We get a better funded tourism promotion uh, for this through the city. You get a stronger Niagara Falls tourism that has more funds available to it. You get a stronger Winter Festival of Lights and you get an integrated approach with major stakeholder collaboration. So tonight we're asking for your approval in principle. As I mentioned, next steps would be, if, if we get your approval in principle tonight, would be to prepare a contract between the city and the hotel association, um, form the hotel association. We wanna start meeting even informally with that hotel association over the next uh, uh, couple of weeks. We've already filed for the letters patent to form a, a, a nonprofit um, association and then, and then go to work. So that is, that is my uh, presentation, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brell. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Brell about the, yes, uh, Councilor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Doug for, for coming, for doing this presentation. I know it was uh, a few months ago when we got the, uh, I guess the legislation from the province where we could, um, I guess, add up to 4% for the transit tax. And we were kind of, you know, we were, I think we looked at it for about two days and, uh, and you guys had no heads up over it. So I'm glad you guys got together as, as stakeholders and as the BIA to get together and come together because you guys are the experts in this field. Um, you know, you guys, last few years have been, uh, been really good and we, and we see that through, uh, through everything from the casino, um, from the numbers that come in from West Winter Festival of Lights, tourism. Um, but it, all ha it, it hasn't all been that good um, you know, years, years ago, which people sometimes don't remember. We had SARS, right. um, which really crushed our hotel industry. Right. Um, we had 9-11. Uh, yeah. And um, you know, with that, we, we, you had to get a passport from the Americans, which basically is, is sums up most of your uh, tourism and the people coming over uh, come to uh, stay at your hotels, and um, you know it, it's it's tough when you're such you got such a great destination, but you are a border town. So we reflect on what happens in the United States, and that includes the the American dollar and right. the exchange. So um, with a strong American dollar, it always makes us do pretty good over here. And with a weak one, it seems like the Americans kind of stay where they have to be. So. 
it hasn't all been good for the hotel owners in, in years, but lately it has been good. So I know you guys have been talking about that. I think this is a, a great start. Um, I, I will uh, I recommend um, in principle that, that we go through this tonight. So I just want to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other counselor, Crater? Um, thank you, Worship. Uh, first, I want to say uh, this is a start. This is an historic day for the tourist industry. Um, and I'm extremely pleased because I've always felt that when that industry works together collectively, there's nothing they can't accomplish. And I, Councillor Strange mentioned it, but there was a lot of things up on the social media and I don't think some of the public quite grasped what was going on. Some of them thought that we were creating attacks, that we were going in a certain kind of direction. So I'm, I just want to say a couple words because I know a number of people uh, said, uh, said they, they were gonna tune in to see this because they thought we were going forward with a new tax. And the opportunity was that the province of Ontario gave direction that municipalities could if they wanted to implement some type of, and they called it a transient tax that we could put as much as 4% on. And the reason I say it's so historic because here in Niagara Falls, the tourist industry, um, and I want to recognize uh, Vince Cario. I know he cannot speak on it, but I know he did a lot of work on this. But the tourist industry came together. And yes. they came up with a proposal saying that, uh, as, as you heard, that they're prepared to set up a system in place, set up a not-for-profit, and contribute the money. But what I think for the residents, and that's why it's so historic, for the residents who sometimes, and there's a fair number who are not involved in the tourist industry, but what they're going to see is the the industry has said, listen, we're gonna take off of your books certain things that you had to pay for that were really for our benefit, for the right. tourist industry's benefit. So we're gonna take over funding, funding the Niagara Falls Tourism. That comes out of our operating budget. We're gonna take over funding the Winter Festival of Lights. That comes out of our operating budget. And there's right. a number of other things. And what that means for the residents is that we will be able to use that money that we were funding those things for, we're gonna be able to use them for some, either more services or doing some roads or doing some additional things that can benefit the residents as well. Right. So this is really historic. Uh, and it was something that when I came back, I was hoping that we could come up with a way of doing this. But I think why it's so historic, it happened so quickly. From the time we got the notification from the province, and I know you only got it within uh, a day or two and then it had to show up on council boat. It's only a couple of months have gone by and you've gotten together and through my sources, I know you had a number of meetings. Yes. And I know you worked with the industry. I know there was a lot of dialogue and there was give and take. Yeah, absolutely. There wasn't one meeting and everybody held hands and said, we're ready to go. Number of meetings, but they all, in the, in the end, it worked out positive. So just gonna conclude with saying, I'm gonna use the word again, but it is historical because the tourist industry will benefit, um, yes. but so will the residents of Niagara Falls. So it's a combination of both. So just want to say congratulations to you and to everyone that was involved in putting this together. As my, as my friend Mike Strain says, I'll be supporting this as well. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Campbell and Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I do have several concerns regarding the report before us. I don't think uh, the report addresses the significant allocations that are gonna be required for the funding of the uh, destination marketing city of Niagara Falls. If you remember my previous comments some time ago about the reporter from the Washington Post not knowing that there was a difference between Niagara Falls, New York and Niagara Falls, Ontario, we have a problem. It is my understanding that the city of Ottawa has allocated a portion of their 4% room tax to a slush fund, so to speak, that is going to be used to make it the number one convention capital of Canada. Our convention center will be at a dis significant disadvantage. Further, the report before us would create another level of unnecessary bureaucracy as far as I'm concerned that, that could possibly be accomplished presently through Niagara Falls tourism. The province of Ontario has created a 4% room tax that the city of Toronto has already enacted. The city of Toronto will be using that 4% room tax 
to market their city as a destination vacation. Who's marketing the city of Niagara Falls presently as a vacation destination? No one. How long are we going to accept the fact that the average time spent by tourists in our city is less than 24 hours? Oh, they will still come to see marine land, the falls, or go up the uh, Skyline Tower, but it will be done on a limited basis as they journey through our city to their vacation destination, Toronto. Furthermore, the report, report calls for the city of Niagara Falls to delegate to a non-elected body as to how these funds will be allocated. Remember, this is a room tax. The operative word is tax. This also brings into question the accountability and transparency of the expenditure of tax dollars, let alone the potential conflict of interest. I cannot support the recommendations before us here tonight. If we delegate the authority to a non-elected committee, the, the authority to decide how to spend our tax dollars of the magnitude that we are talking about, it's, uh, it, it's huge. Let me just go through a couple of things here that I did today at home on my own. I got some statistics. And based on the number of rooms that were in the report, and I got uh, information on an occupancy rate. And I also have uh, the average room rate for our district. <coughs> the uh, total number of rooms I used uh, 12,000. The occupancy, occupancy rate is 60% annually. In Niagara Falls, it's something like 93% in, uh, I'm going to say, July and August. And in uh, uh, October, November, December, January, it's around 53%. So I use 60, which is probably. Um, a good level. And the average room rate is $125 in our district. So if we're charging $2 a room, based on our statistics, it'll approximately bring in $5.3 million. If we charge $4 a room, it will bring in approximately $10.5 million. If we apply a 2% tax, it will bring in approximately 6.5 million compared to 5.3 million for $2 a room. And if we were to take the 40 or 4%, it would represent approximately 13 million. If we charge $4 a room, it's 10.5 million. I'm suggesting to you that we should consider that the numbers that have come up here right now is that the mom and pop operations are contributing more on a dollar by dollar basis if we go by two dollars or four dollars than the big operations that are uh, operating at a much higher level than the hundred twenty five dollar room rate. So the province has given us the authority to implement a four percent increase. Yes, it's going to get the winter festival of lights and all those other things out of our, our, our budget but we should be the ones that are making the decisions with respect to how those funds are allocated. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burrell? If I could just uh, uh, comment on uh, Councilor Campbell's uh, uh, presentation. So the, the model is not new. The model is the model that, that Toronto has adopted for the last decade. And um, it, the Toronto model with their destination uh, marketing fee, they would collect the tax. They would give it to a hotel association. That hotel association would then work with Tourism Toronto and say, we are going to give you some broad objectives. We'd like you to perhaps invest in, in rubber tire market, uh, put 20% of the budget in rubber tire market in the Great Lakes states, and you come back and show us a plan. So it was industry driven. It was hotel association, hotel years who were driving it. And then they would work, with, same thing here. No, it, it's not elected officials. It, it wasn't councillors in, in Toronto, uh, Mr. Councillor. It was, it was the hotel association that was giving broad direction. They were not managing it. It's not our intention to be Niagara Falls Tourism. It's our intention to make Niagara Falls Tourism stronger and a collaborative effort. That's, that, that, that's the intention. If I may, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Burrell. But, you know, if this had to come before us when the destination marketing tax came in at 13%, 
And if you had agreed to come before us and with the same operation at 13.5% or 13%, whatever it was, you know what, we, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars that could have been pumped into the tourist industry. Now we're coming and want to set this whole thing up on the basis of $2 a room. It's a 4% tax that we have made, been made available through the province of Ontario, and I think we t should take full advantage of it. J just, just my last comment is, is I, I'd like you to consider this a start. So bringing all of these people together, this is the closest we've ever been. Uh, all of these entrepreneurs together, it's the closest we've ever been to work together, and it's a start. It's not, it's not the end game. It's a start. So I, I'd like us to consider it. Uh, as that. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councilor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I like the, I like the recommendation before us. Let's remember how we got here. Uh, staff brought a recommendation to Council to pass a transient tax without asking the stakeholders first for their input. Um, it got deferred. We sat with all the stakeholders. I think you've sat with them far more than we have, but we listened to them. And every single solitary time tourism comes here, we're told, we have to listen to the stakeholders. You hand us statistics. You tell us how much money tourism brings into the city. It, it's, it's ad nauseum for Niagara Falls Tourism, for right. Festival of Lights, for Scotia Center. I remember, I remember when we got the convention center. Right. Um, I have two questions. I've been asked numerous times, if this is implemented, will the DMF still be charged at restaurants or other point of purchases outside of um, the hotel fee? I think you brought up a, a, a very uh, uh, important question, and, and that is we have not addressed restaurants in this yet. One man speaking, I'm not speaking for my association, is that I think it's something that we have to address. Uh, fees are part of the travel business. We all know that. So you take a cruise, you rent a car, you book a hotel, there's fees. You know, you, you want to upgrade in, in the airline to a bigger seat, there's fees. We get it. But the difference in that case is that it's it, it's that information is given to the consumer before he purchases, so he knows I'm, I'm going to make the decision if I want to stay at Caesar's Palace and pay a, a thirty dollar fee, uh, resort fee, because it's it's stated before I make my booking. Th that's good business. I think we have to address that transparency in the other sectors of the industry, and I think this association should have to go to work to do that. Okay, you haven't answered my question. Oh. I understand hotel fees. I pay them when I go to them myself. Right. We go to conferences, there's a hotel fee on the end of that bill. Yes. But what there isn't is a fee. When we go to a restaurant, we pay two taxes. There's not a fee added onto our food bill. There's not a fee added onto if I go into a convenience store attached to a hotel, there is not a DMF attached to that. You pay whatever your provincial and federal taxes are. Right. So everybody's saying to me, so they're, they're proposing $2. Yes. Is it going to take the DMF off of the point of purchases outside of the hotel cost? Oh, now I understand. Okay, do you understand sorry. what I'm saying? I, do. I don't have a problem with the $2 <laughs> yes. per room. I understand most places charge a fee, whether whether it is to cover internet or whether it's to cover parking or whether, like, it's a myriad of things. Yes. But the complaint, I mean, nobody's been, been um, mute to the complaint. Right. Nobody likes going into the restaurants and having to pay the DMF at those points of purchases. So the $2 per room, is it going to eliminate and all of the stakeholders, all the hotel owners, taking the DMF off the charges at the hotels or the charges at the other points of purchase? Well, so certainly as far as the hot hotels are concerned, that is the intention. So if I go to Starbucks in the tourist corridor, I'm not paying anything other than for my latte and my federal and provincial tax. Council, I can only tell you that we have never, in any of my discussions with my with with my peers or the stakeholders, talked about restaurants, and I can only say that I think it's something that needs to be addressed that this new association has to police. And I think it's something that the the media has to make clear to the residents because when it said, uh, I think that the paper read um, will eliminate the DMF. Right. I, I'm really happy with the two dollars. It's better than nothing. Right. Um, it's a it's a happy medium between what the stakeholders want uh, the stake what the city wanted and what the stakeholders were offering. Right. I also think it's a starting point. But I really think you need to be clear to people: is that two dollar fee also going to 
um, would be in addition to DMF at other points of purchases because that's problematic for a lot of people in the city. Well, I think I think it's a very fair comment, and 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 I think part of our motivation in in in, in providing uh, the, this infrastructure is is to, is to make it transparent, okay. is, is 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 to make it totally legitimate so everybody can see how much was raised and where did it go. That's the intention here. Well, I we don't think it's thirteen percent. I think I heard thirteen. It's not thirteen percent at at everybody's establishment. No, no. I think today the, the and, and by the way, the DMF is a registered trademark name by the City of Toronto. Most of the hotels here yeah. are calling it a tourism improvement fee. But it's it's changed so many times. Right. DMF. DMF right. I, whatever. Right. Yeah. I, I. I. Everybody's different. I think the average is from six to eight. Okay. And that's going to come off now. Yes. With this two dollar tax. Correct. In restaurants and points of purchase. I, I can't speak to restaurants, well, Councillor. You counselor, better but, get your little association but, uh, together and tell people. Which, which is fair. So it's clear. Which is a fair concern, and, and I think we have to tackle that right, right at the onset. Okay. So I like the fact that the two dollars per room will generate the five million dollars a year. It'll it'll engage the stakeholders to create their association, and we will not be paying for Niagara Falls Tourism right. and Winter Festival of Lights. We won't be paying for Kelly and Ryan. We won't be paying right. for any of those mm -hmm. things. Because I had this little back and forth with someone on Facebook yesterday who said, oh great, they're gonna charge this $2 tax. Their entire 24 million that they got from the OLG went totally to tourism. And that's why it's pretty down there. And I said, no, right. that is so not true. But this is something that will be legal. It's something the province has told us. It's something that will, people complain the money's not tracked. This money will be tracked. Absolutely. The city will administrate it for a fee, and you'll be able to um, calculate what's coming in and what's going out. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councilor Pierangelo. Yeah, Your Worship. I guess uh, just some comments. Um, like many others, I, I, I find a lot of positive points in, in the report. I'll talk about them in a second. Um, but I do want to say that I am a bit frustrated as to how we got here. I think it was back in 2003 when the province rolled out uh, the notion of tourism operators collecting a DMF. And I thought that the core values of the DMF were very good at that time. You know, they could, they could collect funds, they could, uh, and then they could use them for marketing. Um, what was really lacking on the province's part was clear guidelines as to how that money was uh, supposed to be collected or supposed to be dispersed. And I think uh, now for the province to simply just replace what they were the ones that first instituted, they're replacing it with a tax and it's almost like they're holding a carrot out in front of the nose of municipalities and saying, if you pass this, I'm going to allow you to uh, save 50% of the money that you collect for yourself. And I think it's almost a caveat for municipalities to, to use it as a cash cow, which in my opinion really goes against the, the core values of what the DMF was created to, uh, to help, which was you know, marketing one destination. And so I know, I know there's been comments uh, already about cities collecting monies and then using it for marketing. Uh, I, I can't honestly say that uh, I agree with the fundamentals of that because I, I don't really believe that it's government's role to institute a special tax, collect that money, um, use 50% of it to market and then 50% of it for whatever else they want to use it for. I think if that was the case then a long time ago Oshawa would have put a special tax on General Motors and uh, Kitchener would have put a special tax on Blackberry, and the list goes on and on. So I, I guess those are my um, those are my gripes with uh, with the whole um, process of how, of how we got here today. But I do want to talk about the positives in the report because I think that there are some uh, there are some real big win situations, and the first win that I see is uh, you know not only for City Hall but also for the residents. I know it's already been talked about that in our operating budget right now, we have just over $700,000 that we use to fund both Niagara Falls Tourism and Winter Festival of Lights. We're no longer gonna have that. Uh, the tourism operators are now going to bear the cost of that. Uh, the other funds that we uh, were spending in the last few years were uh, in total about $700,000 from the OLG funds. We're not gonna have that anymore. I think that's a win for City Hall and it's also a win for all of our taxpayers in the sense that it's not funded from taxation anymore. 
And the other big win that I see, Your Worship, is um, the destination as a whole. I think, again, if I go back to the core values, the core values of the DMF was that, you know, uh, operators would uh, collect money um, used for one specific purpose, which was to market the destination. And, you know, it, it, it's different because in Niagara Falls, we had a situation where, you know, Hotel X was collecting their money and then marketing their property, and Hotel Y was collecting their money and then marketing their property. And now what we're going to have is a pool of money coming together to market the destination of Niagara Falls, which I think in, in turn will be better for everyone. So I will support the vote. Thank you. And if there's no further comments, then I'll throw mine in. Uh, yes, Mr. Can Bell? I just make one of last uh, uh, comment that hasn't really come up? And that is, <clears throat> certainly it's the intention for, for, for the tourism and the hotels administering this and giving direction uh, 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 to the uh, various agencies in a collaborative process to be self-sufficient. But uh, as, as, the, as the report to, to Council uh, suggested about the, about the OLG fund, we would just like to keep the door open for that rare occasion. If there was something amazing, if, if, if we could get the country music festival, I don't know, whatever a good example is, and we just needed a little bit more money, we would love to be able to come back on those special occasions, not as a norm, and 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 see if 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 that could uh, if we could get some some money from OLG in that rare occasion. That's all. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. My suggestion would be that it be a four percent tax, and you take that money, extra money, and you go out and you hustle those organizations and events to bring them here to our city. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ionone. This isn't a public meeting, right? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's public. Are, no, but I mean in the public meeting sense that you have to close it. No. Well, Mr. Bell, you're done. Are you, have you explained everything you wanted to explain? I, I have. Then, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve staff's recommendations of the $2 per night, and I'll make that motion. Okay, that's moved by uh, Councilor Ironi, seconded by Councilor Strange, and I'll weigh in with my comments. Um, I, you know, hearing all the comments, uh, I agree, I think the main thing is, this is a good start. And to get all the tourism industry together is very difficult. All the personalities are so unique. And we're very different from Toronto and Ottawa because we're not corporate, we're families, mostly. And because of that, there's personalities, there's challenges, and it's not an easy task to get everyone together. So you've done a good job. Uh, I know some of the different members are in the room here today. The other thing that a lot of people, that if they don't travel a lot, they don't realize, Destination marketing type charges happen in every major jurisdiction in the world, wherever you travel. Some call them, there's resort fees, there's tip fees, DMF fees, whatever you want to call it, but there are different fees wherever you travel, all major uh, destinations. I think the idea too, and I know it doesn't say in the report, but I can say in our discussions, we said, we'll look at this yearly between the city and the industry and see if there's mutually agreed upon changes that have to happen. I've heard from some of the major players that said, we believe that we're going to end up probably upping it because once there's trust in the industry, and this is really a big deal for them all to come together and, and, and agree that this is a great start because once they trust and they see the benefits of it, the benefits, well, one, we talk about destination marketing, something we don't do enough of here. It's great to market the properties and the attractions, but when you market the destination the same way Newfoundland and Labrador does, and you see these incredible commercials for these places that draw people because they've got incredible destination marketing, period. You look at Las Vegas, you look at Orlando, places that attract much more people than Niagara Falls do, it's obvious it's successful, and they put a lot of money into it. So I'm, I'm thrilled that a portion of this will go to destination marketing. The other thing, special events. You made reference to uh, live with Kelly and Ryan. I know that we're working to bring other major sh shows here, like Ellen as an example. I know that uh, one uh, successful operator keeps talking about Elton John on a Tuesday in October. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great ideas out there that we could do that would definitely draw more people, spend more time, and certainly sp spend more money. I think overall, it's a good thing. I know there's been discussion that the province says we can charge up to 4%. That's not true. That's not actually, in fact, they don't give us a number. They give us a range up to the municipality. 
And I know there's a set of challenges with doing a percentage as well. Although I agree with Councillor Campbell that more money we'll be able to do so much more with it. And, but I also see the challenge of what it's been like to get everyone at the table. And it's not been easy. So I just want to compliment the work that's been done and also by our staff that's been working very closely and meeting with the industry. I think, again, it's a good start going in the right direction and hopefully as this proceeds and is successful, it'll encourage everyone to maybe commit more to this program. So we've got the motion, we've got it seconded. We'll call that vote. We've got three um, uh, conflicts, thank you. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, opposed? Okay, with one contrary. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, we're moving along to reports. 7.1, cancellation, reduction, or refunds of taxes. I would move the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. 7.2, monthly tax receivables report. Again, move the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, uh, second, or seconded by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. 7.3, municipal accounts. I would move the accounts. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Thank you. 7.4, development charges exemption for Lundy's Lane CIP properties. I would move the recommendation and I thank staff for putting back the report in the timeline. Okay. So that's moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Thompson, and that goes along with the compliment to staff for doing a great job. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. 7.5, Neighborhood Playground Replacement Project Update. Come on, someone's gonna jump in here. We're gonna give it all to Councillor Peter Angelo to set a record. Yeah, move the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo. I think we have a record. Second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? And that's approved. You do have a record, Councillor. We just confirmed with the clerk that is a record. Item 7.6, Request for Extension of Commercial Building Facade Grant Approval. Moved by Councillor Cario. Seconded by Councillor Thompson, the record is broken. All those in favor, and that's approved, thank you. It was a good run, Councillor Peter Angelo. <laughs> Item 7.7, .7, McBain Community Center Pool Repair. Moved by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Cario. All those in favor, and that's approved, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Item 7.8, naming and renaming of so parks. Moved by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Thank you for that. Item 7.9, Nichols Lane Speed Limit Review. Uh, do we have any comments? Okay, moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. On to planning matters. Uh, since it's not 6 yet. Okay, to, uh, sounds good. Yep, communications. Okay, we're going to jump ahead. Planning matters are advertised to start at 6.30, so we're going to move ahead to item 9, communications and comments of the city clerk. St. Paul High School Spirit Day requesting to permit up to three food trucks on the school property and waive licensing fees. Moved by Councillor Crater, second by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 9.2, the small, I'm sorry, the Ontario Small Urban Convention, known as OSUM, is having their AGM this May at the Sheraton in Niagara Falls. Uh, moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Campbell, that we are aware of the conference in town. All those in favor? And that's approved. And Councillor Morocco, you are a, a member of that? Actually, just a reminder that uh, everybody has an invitation to attend, so it would be nice to see some of our uh, councillors there supporting OSUM and some of the uh, motions that may came, come forward that have to be addressed with the province. And Councillor, that conference is gonna take place at the? Sh um, Sharon. The Sheridan, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for that. And thank you for your work in bringing the conference uh, to Niagara Falls as well. And I know Mr. Felicetti's worked very hard as well. Um, item 9.3, the Niagara Regional Labor Council requesting that April 28th be proclaimed as a national day of mourning in the city of Niagara Falls and further, the council staff be invited to attend the ceremony at 10.30 and that'll be this Saturday morning at 10.30 a.m. in front of City Hall. Moved by Councilor Crater, second by Councilor Campbell. All those in favor? Thank you, that's approved. 
9.4, Fallen Daffa Association of Canada, requesting the month of May be recognized as Fallon Daffa Month in the City of Niagara Falls. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange, uh, Strange. All those in favor? And that's approved, thank you. 9.5, moving transit forward, interim branding strategy and a communica communications approach. Moved by Councillor Morocco, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? And that's approved, thank you. Item 9.6, City of Welland resolution requesting the Ontario government to implement reforms that would encourage the remediation of abandoned contaminated properties. We have support. Councillor Cario, motion uh, in support. Second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. 9.7, National Congress Italian Canadian Niagara Peninsula District celebrating the eighth annual Italian Heritage Month along with Giovanni Caboto Day, would like to request the flag raising on Friday, June the 1st at noon. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor, and that's approved. Thank you. What was that, Councillor? Nothing. Did you, you're, you're, I thought you were volunteering to be there that day for that, okay. Uh, item nine, I'm sorry, TAPS, uh, 9.8. Uh, Taps Brewing Company requesting relief of the noise bylaw for various events for 2018 on Queen Street. Moved by Councilor Strange, second by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Item 9.9, .9, Rotary Niagara Falls Sunrise Rib Fest, requesting that the City of Niagara Falls declare their 14th annual Niagara Rotary Rib Fest a community event to be held June 15th, 16th, 17th at the Niagara Square. That's moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Morocco. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Ratification of in-camera matters. Okay, we have nothing to ratify from in-camera. Uh, what do you got now, new business? Yeah, you can do new business. Okay, okay new business. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I had a couple of uh, complaints, phone calls, about uh, whether it's fox or coyotes uh, in the north end uh, along the old uh, high, uh, hydro roadway. Uh, up in that uh, the area. The Hollis Trail? Uh, yes, the Hollis Trail. Yeah. Uh, to the point where uh, people have lost pets. They jump the fences and uh, it appears to be getting more out of hand. Uh, I don't know who's responsible for looking into that, but perhaps we could uh, have staff move something forward to, uh, if, if it's the region, uh, let's see if we can make something happen. I think it's economic development, I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure Mr. Phillips said it's here. Maybe he could look into it. No, I appreciate that, and, I, and I'm aware as well. And uh, we've been having an, uh, an issue with coyotes in the city and, and uh, jumping the fence and grabbing unsuspecting pets, and they're coming further into the city. So I can tell you, uh, we did have some meetings where we did have the problem along St. James, and we brought in Coyote Watch Canada, Leslie Sampson, who does a great job at helping to figure out why they're in the city. And in this case, and in most cases, it's because people are feeding them, and they're putting food out for them, and, uh, and also when you have a bird feeder, it attracts birds and squirrels, which then in fact ends up attracting foxes and coyotes. And sometimes they'll see a little pet and they'll see that as lunch as well. So you're absolutely correct. Yes, Councillor? Uh, just for what it's worth, my daughter had a run in on uh, uh, Montrose Road with a coyote and uh, I was just informed, and she wasn't hurt, um, but I was just informed uh, the other day that the car has been declared a complete write-off. Wow. Okay. So we've got a motion by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that we refer this concern to staff for a report back to Council. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. That's good, Mr. Fellows, that he heard it, so he can get on it right away. Get his little fox hat on and figure it out. Uh, new business. Councillor Thompson. Um, yeah, I don't uh, think we're going to make a decision on this tonight, but uh, <clears throat> I think it's something that we have to deal with. We talked about it uh, at the last meeting, and uh, we're talking about vacation uh, rentals, uh, um, and uh, there was a suggestion about a grace period uh, for the uh, rentals until the end of the year. Uh, I've had a uh, substantial response from many people uh, uh, having concern about these in residential areas. 
the complaints continue. Uh, people are having problems. We're sending the staff out in one situation that was brought to my attention. Uh, there was noise and uh, drinking and partying and uh, disturbing the residential area. And the staff went out and said, well, you better cool it and keep it down, but we can't do anything about it because the council has suggested a grace period. Um, this really creates a lot of concern for the people who are being affected uh, out there uh, with respect to this grace period. Um, they uh, want to know, are all the ones that we've closed down already, are they able to come back in? And how many are we going to have new ones come back on stream uh, during the grace period? <coughs> I think we have to uh, really come up with a, uh, uh, a definitive plan with respect to uh, protecting the people in residential areas. Uh, I was also given a letter uh, sent to me, I give it to the uh, CAO, and here's an article uh, in, the, in the paper uh, for a condo to be sold, and uh, it says you can have a first class condo uh, in this place, or you can use it as an Airbnb. Uh, I think that uh, we got a, a serious problem, and I think we're handling it in a very uh, negligent way, and I think we have to drop the hammer and say that these things are not supposed to be in residential areas and uh, protect the people and we knock them off one at a time as we have been doing and make sure that, uh, and it's gonna take a long time. And uh, you heard some of the comments uh, at the last meeting where uh, the uh, new association that was formed and uh, the comment was, well, we're uh, already here, and regardless of what you do, we're going to continue on. So that tells you a story. Uh, the other things that uh, uh, were said, uh, you know, people have already rented uh, these uh, rooms out, and, uh, the, you know, they're not going to come here. Um, we're not Crystal Beach. We're in the hotel business. Uh, we have 30 hotels, high rise, already approved through this council for through the planning process, and none of them have gone ahead because of the uh, high cost of uh, development charges. And we're in the hotel business. If you got five hotels that went up, the uh, taxes to the municipality would be enormous. The number of jobs that would be created would be unbelievable. And I don't think that uh, putting the clamp on this situation now uh, is a bad idea and it's going to prevent people from coming here. Uh, I think we have a responsibility. They're illegal to give them a grace period for illegal uh, accommodation, I think is a mistake. And uh, I uh, think we should have a report and a full discussion and debate on this. You want me to make the motion? Yeah, okay. Um, pardon me? Just on that point, I thought we were coming back to this meeting to discuss yeah. Yeah. issues such as fees, enforcement, yeah. grace period. Yeah. That's what I okay. thought this meeting was for. Um, yeah. Anyway, the, um, the also I'll get you. I'll get you one second. Also, also, yes, yes. also on the fees, um, uh, we're talking about thousand dollars. What is uh, just this is a cost to the municipality, five hundred dollars a year after that, um, uh, suggesting that this was uh, excessive. Uh, I think it's uh, appropriate, and the other loophole which I think uh, we had was a suggestion for a uh, bed and breakfast to have a manager in there. I think you have to have, if you have a manager come in, uh, I think you got uh, a, a, a rental, vacant rental again, uh, because 
the manager's sick, so he doesn't show up, he leaves early, he's got something. I think you have to have a live-in partner. It's worked all these years for bed and breakfast, so I think it's mandatory that you have to have somebody live in. So um, I'd be uh, willing to uh, make a motion on this uh, uh, after I hear uh, some of the other comments, but uh, um, the reaction I got was uh, pretty severe from uh, the public regarding what are we going to do? You're going to make these things uh, legal when they're already illegal? Uh, or legal when they're already illegal? So anyway, um, I'd like to hear some of the other comments. Okay, well, just before we do that, I'm going to ask our uh, staff to, to weigh in uh, about what the fees and recommendations. The one thing I do want to say, I brought it to staff's uh, um, attention. I said, I understand that we're telling people that there's nothing we can do. And I was told that's not at all what's happening. If they're breaking the rules in terms of noise, garbage, cars, they're, they're bringing the hammer down on them, they're shutting them down. That is not changing. And they are, it's the, the, the quiet ones that we don't even know that are existing that we'd have no complaints about. Those are the ones that are being given time so we can get up to speed. We gotta hire staff, we gotta come up with a process. And Mr. Beeman explained that to me. And Mr. Beeman, if you could maybe if, answer. If, if, someone, if someone is telling, Remember the public that we don't go after one that's making noise there. It's directly contradicting what Mr. Spencer told them to do. And if we got one that's making noise, garbage, parking, we go after it, and we our goal is to shut it down. That is what we will do. We will not we we don't allow any that are already closed to reopen. What we are the only complaints that are not being investigated on this idea of a grace period are ones where the sole complaint is the fact that it is an Airbnb, not anything else if there's other aspects to it then we go then we're going after it that was what was discussed that was in the memo i sent to council as to what we're doing so far we're subject to the, to the, the direction of council and that's why we're here to make sure that that's what council wants because council may not want a shorter period may want to go right you know, just to enforce it right now that's what we're, we're looking for direction from council on this point i don't think we're quite ready to report on the fee at this point um I think we, then I would ask council to give us a little more time to put some information together for you on that. But we need a, a kind of immediate direction on the enforcement because that's ongoing right now. And we're, it, there's, I just put well, the, the memo together to, to start discussion. What council wants to do is what we're here to find out. Okay, well, Councilor Thompson, and then I've got to. Well, I think, I think you carry on doing what you're doing. I don't think we have to say we have a grace period. Mm -hmm. We just carry on close the ones down mm -hmm. that uh, are causing the problem in the residential areas, uh, uh, suggest uh, to the real estate industry that uh, they better not uh, be uh, advertising Airbnbs in uh, condo developments. Wow, what a disaster. Anyway, um, I think just carry on, close the ones that are ca causing the problems. Uh, I don't think we have to give a grace period. Just carry on. Okay, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo, then Crater. Yeah, Your Worship, I, I was just going to say that I'm I'm not so sure I agree with the thought process that you know you're not going to I guess uh, pursue uh, enforcement of any of them where you don't have complaints of either noise or garbage or parking. I think in some way that that has to open up liability on the city's behalf in the sense that you're now um, condoning something that is contrary to your own bylaws uh, simply because you know, you're not receiving a complaint about it. I think just knowing about it is enough to actually go out there and act on it. I'm not sure that I agree with the distinction between. I think a lot of neighbors are nice in the sense that you know they're going to they're going to put up with things um, because they want to be neighborly. But, you know, I mean, what happens when a neighbor calls in that there's a complaint of noise and the bylaw officer gets there and there's no noise? Do they then pursue it as a noise complaint? Or do they then pursue it as, well, they're operating, in, they're operating illegally, but they're compliant in noise? I mean, I, 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 I think there's too much gray area. I agree with Councillor Thompson in the sense that I would much prefer to just simply say there isn't a grace period, 
let's start the process. We've already made the decision in regards to zoning. Let's maintain residential zones as residential zones. As the complaints come in, we deal with them. That's what I would prefer, Your Worship. Okay, Councillor Crater. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm just gonna follow on along with uh, Councillor Peter Angelo and, and, and Thompson, but uh, Councillor Thompson, but we kind of opened the door to this this term called grace period because, and just to give the council an example, I had uh, a fellow called me up and he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm running and, and there's real concern about it. I'm running a little business out of my home doing some mechanical work. Um, I know I'm not supposed to, so I guess I'm going to have to close it down. Can I go into the grace period? Now that you've established grace period, can we have one for what I do? And I said, well, no, we don't allow that. And he said, yeah, but Kim, I have 30 cars lined up over the next couple of months to come in I'm going to do work for. So since I have them in place already, can I have a grace period? Because he had watched the Airbnbs and saw that. And he thought the rationale for him to continue operating something that was illegal was to go into the grace period because he has 30 or 40 cars or something in place for the next couple of months and he should be allowed to at least finish that time frame. So I, I think maybe I was, you know, I, I realized what happened at the meeting, you know, sometimes we get, our hearts get in, in, in the way of trying to stick to the law and we were trying to help the people who felt they already had things in place and they wanted to allow to be continue on. I'm just giving you a kind of a heads up because you may have others start showing up who are doing things improperly and saying, <coughs> can we fall into that grace period? And a couple of residents called me and we're talking about, and they expressed the same things as, as what I'm just saying, this idea of a grace, grace period. So um, I'd like it to come back as quickly as possible. I know Councillor Thompson is going to make a motion, but we, 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 we need to deal with this. I, I'm sure that most of you got the, the emails we got from other communities, what's happening in, in, in even other countries. I think I saw, uh, I sent one to Councillor Thompson about Japan, how they've really gone oh, the complete other way to to stop these from taking place because there's no more uh, apartments available. There's all kinds of problems with housing now and they've just basically outlawed them and now the Airbnb Association, I didn't realize how powerful this body is, but it's a pretty powerful organization, how they're stepping in and just going to try to challenge any municipality uh, that takes any action to try to prevent these or deter these from going forward. Um, because it's such a, a, a big business. But for our residents, and someone said it, I mean, residents, residential communities are residential communities. And I just think once we open the door, even with the grace period, then we're opening the door. So uh, that's all I wanted to share. Thanks. I, I, just before I ask the CAO to talk, I just wanted to point something out here, a couple of things. I don't want to get lost here. Uh, we had the public meeting last time. It was a unanimous resolution. That's the first thing. When we had the crowd here, and we had people telling their stories about being able to pay their mortgage payments, their taxes, people from all over the world that already had their rooms booked, that are on their way in here. Uh, they told stories that they've been doing this for years without incident. Uh, we had the one guy say he did some rough numbers. There's around 100,000 room night rentals with 44 complaints. He said the numbers are minimal and, he, and, and the argument was give us time to get out of this. And staff said we don't have the staff here anyway to enforce it right now. So we're trying to just shut down the bad ones and then we'll get to the rest of them. So I thought it was a balanced, sensible approach to dealing with this. And you make a good point, Councillor, but we made a, re a unanimous resolution when the people were here. So now that the people aren't here, we're gonna change our decision? I think we gotta have the same kind of public opportunity for them. Yeah. Yes, Councillor. Yeah, decision. just on that point. We, we did, we voted on it. We didn't make no, a decision we, on it. We, no, the we, the motion on the, that was on the floor was that we voted on the zoning aspect of it right. only, right. and the other items <laughs> we deferred to this meeting. I actually thought that those items were gonna be back on this agenda. And those items included fees, whether or not there would be a grace period, not, not how long of one there was going to be, whether or not there would be one, and enforcement. We were supposed to talk about these issues at this meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I think the thought process of council last meeting was simply that we didn't want to muddy the waters because one person was saying grace period, one person had a gripe about the fees, you know, another person wanted to talk about enforcement. So we wanted to agree on one aspect. We agreed on the zoning and all the other items we deferred to this meeting but they're not back here in front of us. 
Mr. Seo. Well, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Well, first of all, we, we didn't commit to have it back at this meeting. Uh, we committed to have a report back. The reason it wouldn't be at this meeting, Mr. Beeman had made a commitment to meet with some of the individuals that spoke at the meeting uh, to garner further information from them. They had talked about an association they'd started. He wanted to meet with that group to see if there was any information he could glean from them. So we knew it wouldn't be back for this meeting. In fact, just so council has an appreciation of the council schedule, we were reviewing reports for this agenda tonight Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, after the last meeting on Tuesday. That's the turnaround time. So when you have these meetings back to back on, on a two week cycle, very difficult to turn a, uh, a report back around that quickly. Uh, Mr. Beeman still hasn't completed that work. Our hope would have it back as soon as we can. In the interim, what we've done is with the approval of the operating budget, we've now gone on, gone out and posted for two additional enforcement officers. That's out there now. Uh, we should have those jobs filled hopefully within the next month they'll be here just for the summer season when things start to heat up and those individuals our bylaw officer and uh, staff are going to be on a uh, rotating summer schedule uh, that will be seven days a week uh, giving us coverage throughout that sort of peak tourist season so we hope to have that st uh, staff complement up uh, up by an additional two members within about a month that will assist with this problem. As Mr. Beam has indicated, in the meantime, as we got complaints, we were following up in a similar manner. We did not change our approach. I personally spoke to Mr. Spencer the next day as did Mr. Beeman, say carry on, regardless of whether council puts in a grace period or not, if there's complaints on noise, garbage, uh, parties, whatever's going on, we're gonna go on like we did with the other ones and shut them down. So that message right. was given loud and clear to the enforcement staff and if there's some miscommunication, I'll go down personally again tomorrow morning and deliver to them again, but that was the message that was given. Uh, the report on fees and uh, the actual grace period in terms of we need to determine, and this will come back in the report, a, a deadline simply because we can't get to everybody. There, there's, there's probably 300 or more out there. We can't get to everybody right away and the approach was the ones that people are just complaining about because they happen to know it's there or they saw an ad, but there's really no physical complaining. We'll put them off until we can get to them. That was the approach. Because our staff is looking at handling the ones where there's noise complaints and stuff that they can deal with right now. But the problem is, is that if people keep booking, we're gonna have difficulty, more difficulty shutting them down. If we get a definitive date, we can put the people on notice and say, don't book any bookings. We're gonna get to you, but don't book any bookings past whatever the date is. I mean, that I think helps our case by getting that definitive date, and that's what we're going to be looking for council to do. <coughs> Councilor Kerry. Just to be clear, so that if someone does call in and say, there's an Airbnb beside me, they're not making noise, they're on our list. So they, they yes. may not be on the radar today because our pilot officers are busy uh, doing, trying to get rid of the ones that are causing trouble. Yes. But there's no initiative by our city to ignore those. No. They're on the list and a priority would be the other ones, but they're still being told they're not legal and we will yeah. come after you. Absolutely, and what the staff's been instructed to do when you get those calls, we're, we're creating that database. So we're taking the names and addresses, we're creating that so that we will have it when we get to them uh, to give notice or whatever we need to do. Mr. Bain, yeah. yeah, the plan um, that, that I had in mind and the we're working towards would be that when we get that list, as, as Mr. Charles, we're going to record which ones there are complaints at. Then we plan when we had the actual deadline, we would send them a letter that says, you know, we're coming to see you in whenever the time is expired, and we're hoping you're shut down because at that point we're going to start after you. And these are sort of again for the ones that aren't that the immediate neighbors are tolerating. Then we go in when we when we have our new enforcement people. And once we get dealing with the ones that are truly bad apples, and we come in and say, "Okay, council gave you till now, you better be shut down right now," and then we'll then we'll go through the whole process. That's our plan. Yep. So they would have a warning that this is the day, and that would be when we show up after that day. So, Mr. Mayor, if I may, and I'm not sure what motion councilor Thompson can for, but tonight, if you talk about this phase, and if we could just get council to commit to a definitive date, say, you know, we want to put a cutoff date by this time, so the staff can get to them and do this. We'd be happy to take that date. I mean, that's basically the, the phase in report would be, is just getting a date to pin this down. So, um, 
you know, we had talked, we had kicked around ourselves by saying the end of the year, if that's too long. But again, there's no guarantee based on the volume that there may be that we can get to all of them by the end of the year anyway. So um, that's kind of what we had in our mind uh, to be able to put the people on notice. The other reports dealing with fees and whether it needs to be uh, manager occupied or owner occupied, that could be a report that could could come when we, we get there, hopefully in, in uh, the next meeting or the meeting after. Uh, but the important one is getting that phase and period or that, that date nailed down if we could tonight. Yeah. Councilor Morocco? Uh, Your Worship, I know that uh, one of the gentlemen that spoke uh, in regards, I think he had a number of uh, vacation rental properties himself, <coughs> but um, he did mention about a ruling that was uh, made by the Supreme Court of Canada in regards to uh, some of the uh, vacation rental properties that had been operating in the city that had closed them down. I've actually done a search, I really couldn't find too much, so I'm actually going to ask that our legal also follow up on any um, motions by the Supreme Court on any rulings that might have been uh, that came up because uh, I don't have that legal. I am looking at something based on British Columbia and basically they were talking about how they deal with their uh, TUPs they call it uh, temporary uh, what is it uh, temporary use permits and they deal with them on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and I think that we uh, also mentioned that too, uh, as well at the last uh, meeting, so that they would come in independently to ask. So if we could actually also uh, have some legal uh, advice on that, that would be great as to, you know, Sean, now, I have to say that I totally agree with these ones that are, you know, rowdy and uh, just uprooting a, a neighborhood. They need to be shut down immediately. No grace period at all. Mr. Um, Mayor? Yes, I, I think the gentleman in question was a bit mistaken about the uh, his interpretation of the case, which I think is the one he's referring to, and uh, what he was really concerned about was this owner of uh, this idea of having the owner occupying, and uh, there are uh, some. And we went through this with the second units, and there is a, a school of uh, thought that thinks that requiring owner occupation is uh, violates the rules against zoning on the basis of relationship between people. Um, and having thought it over when council was wrestling with it, I really, when you actually think about it, ownership is a relationship between an object and a person. It's not a relationship between people. So I was quite prepared to defend council and still am. In fact, the bylaws on the agenda today uh, with the ownership, with the because because the province didn't ban that distinction which council wanted to make. So for the second units, we're going to put in the bylaw that council wanted, which specifies that the owner has to be in the store, as it were, in one of the two units. Um, I saw the same distinction. I don't see any difficulties, particularly when you're dealing with a commercial use, which is really a commercial use, is the, uh, the, these short-term rentals. I don't see any problem with requiring the owner and specifying that bed and breakfast if that's what council desires to do. And council has expressed that wish, and I'd be happy to argue that case on your behalf should it be required. Um, so I, do, I don't believe that there is a, any uh, law restricting you from doing what you've been proposing to do so far. Any other discussion on this topic? Yeah. Well, did, did we make any decision? Well, we're, the report's going to come I back. Think, I, I think, um, you know, this, this is a massive problem, not uh, here, around the world, but New York State. Um, <laughs> I have had probably 50 reports uh, from uh, a friend of mine, uh, Stephen McGannity, uh, who is, uh, Every day I get another report. New York State, uh, there's more Airbnbs than the major hotel chains uh, there. The housing, the people can't afford to rent an apartment uh, because they're building apartment buildings and you can't rent one because they're all Airbnbs. Uh, they are uh, really a serious concern. It's kind of funny, we were talking a couple of weeks ago about uh, the homeless and uh, no place to uh, get apartments here. The lowest level we've ever had. It's because uh, all of these vacant rentals are being uh, taken up uh, and it's a serious problem. I think we just carry on with our enforcement people uh, looking after the problems and look look forward to uh, trying to clear it up you won't you won't clear it up by the end of the year that's a joke uh, you know how do you know where all these are I think we just continue on with the enforcement 
we made the decision about uh, not in residential areas. We've designated the areas that they can be legal and we uh, enforce it and carry on from here. I, I, I think, think that's, that's what they're doing. That's, that's what you're doing. Right now. No, it's not. I don't like a grace period. As soon as you get a grace period, then you get no problem. Your Worship, if I can just try to address this. Um, there seems to be a distinction between a grace period and when we can actually, and when our bylaw officers can actually get there. I don't really know that the two coincide though. I don't think that they should be melded together to say, well, we won't be able to get to you for three months, so we're gonna give you a grace period until the end of the year. We're gonna legitimize the activity that you're doing. Absolutely. Because if you get there within two months, they're gonna turn around and say to you, I'm not a problem, why are you here? And then what are we gonna say? We've already given out some type of grace period. I would prefer <coughs> if there wasn't a grace period and we just simply said, listen, we're gonna get around to you when we have a complaint and when our bylaw officers can get there. I think that would be the fair way of doing mm -hmm. it, to be honest with you. I, 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 I agree. Well, did you wanna make that motion? Yeah, well, yeah, I'd make the motion that uh, we carry on looking after the uh, complaints and to try to clear them up in residential areas. Did you get that to go? Okay. Moved by Councillor uh, Thompson, second by Councillor Pierangelo. Councillor Morocco? No, it's just. Oh, you're voting in favor? Yep. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. So we're going to go to the planning uh, part of our meeting. Uh, we've got our public meeting. Good sheet right there. And I'd ask our clerk if he would please introduce the next item on the agenda. public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw uh, to permit the construction of two single detached dwellings on the west side of Montrose Road, north of Matthews Drive. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the regulations on Friday, March 23rd, 2018. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the formerly Ontario Municipal Board, uh, now uh, LPAT, uh, shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Matson. I now ask our acting director of planning to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Your Worship and uh, members of council, uh, this is an application to amend uh, the city zoning bylaw, file AM 2018-003. The applicant is Fern Pasquale. And as you've already heard, the application is to permit two single detached dwellings on a parcel of land uh, on the west side of Montrose Road. If you could flip the could do it. As I, was, as, I was, as I was saying, the uh, property is uh, 0.1 of a hectare. It's on the west side of Montrose Road, just north of Matthews Drive. And the <coughs> amendment is requested to facilitate the future severance of the, of the land into two parcels for two single detached dwellings. So the applicant is uh, requesting a zone change for the parcel. It's currently zoned single family, <coughs> 1A density, 
with uh, site-specific regulations. And the requested zone is the single-family <coughs> 1E density zone. Uh, there was an open house held on March 21st, and it was attended by the owner of the abutting property to the south, the developer, as well as uh, city staff. The neighbor uh, to the south that attended the meeting had concerns about a loss of privacy, uh, an increase in their taxes, and potential flooding from storm drainage. And the applicant responded to that concern and expressed a willingness to plant trees on the neighbor's property along the southerly lot line to mitigate any loss or perceived loss of privacy. And in terms of the other two concerns, staff's response included that uh, the applicants required to contain storm drainage on their own property so as not to impact uh, abutting properties. This is a fairly standard requirement. And in respect of the uh, assessment, uh, that's determined by MPAC and the municipality has no control over that. Uh, this tile uh, illustrates the location of the property. As I said, the site is uh, just north of Matthews Drive in the northern section of the city, Mount Carmel. Uh, the, the subject site is immediately adjacent to an Ontario Hydro Transmission Corridor. And I'd also like to point out the fact that the site is opposite uh, the site of the uh, approved Gratola Court subdivision. Uh, many of you may recall uh, that matter coming before council a number of months ago, and that was approved uh, by council not only the subdivision but also a zoning amendment and I'll elaborate on that a little bit further later on. Uh, this, this plan illustrates the intended division of the land into the, into the two parcels and illustrates uh, the, the applicant's vision for these two homes uh, that would be constructed on the property. And. Uh, I might as well bring to your attention now, though I won't elaborate immediately, but the, the driveways um, are L-shaped. Um, they are as wide as the driveway and they widen uh, closer to the garage. And uh, I'll explain that further in my presentation. Not having success moving. Okay, here we go. So as council is becoming more aware, the Planning Act requires uh, planning decisions to comply with provincial policies. And the province is uh, pushing municipalities to be uh, more vigilant in, in making efficient use of their land and services to meet in intensification targets. Uh, these lands are within the settlement area, uh, the provincial policy statement. They're also within the built-up area. And uh, the lands are currently undeveloped, obviously, uh, but they are zoned for one detached dwelling. And the proposed development is a form of residential intensification that is promoted by the province. And it will assist the city in achieving the 40% intensification target uh, within the built-up area. Slow on here. What's that? And no, no, I've gone too far. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of the city's official plan, the land is designated residential. It's intended to be developed for housing. Uh, apartment buildings are typically encouraged along arterial roads, such as Montrose Road, um, whereas low density development, detached, semi detached, and non street townhouses are encouraged along local and collector roads. Now these lands are located along an arterial road. Uh, however, the land's not suitably sized uh, for an apartment building or, or any uh, project of any magnitude. However, the proposal does meet our minimum uh, density requirements as outlined in our official plan. And we're of the opinion that the single attached dwellings are compatible with the surrounding land uses, uh, including the recently approved Gratola Court subdivision on the east side of Montrose Road, which I alluded to uh, a moment ago. Um, 
just carrying on with the official plan, we believe that the proposed dwellings are compatible and uh, suitable in terms of density, massing, setback, and appearance. And what we're noticing is that the supply of detached dwellings in the Northwest Planning District is becoming extremely low, and this will uh, provide uh, at least one additional uh, dwelling in, in the neighborhood. As I mentioned earlier, the, the lands are zoned a single family 1A density category. And that zoning was established by the council in, in place in 1995 when the Mount Carmel North Plan of Subdivision was approved. Uh, this chart that's on your screen illustrates the, the differences between the, the current zoning and what's uh, being requested. And as I alluded to earlier, the current zoning would only allow one detached dwelling to be built on the parcel, whereas the requested 1E zone would permit the land to be severed into two parcels and allow two detached dwellings to be built. So they're proposing a different standard of development. You'll notice that the frontage, for example, is approximately half uh, of what the, the zoning was established uh, in a larger area uh, back in 95. So the, the requested zone will pro provide for residential intensification and a more compact form that's consistent with the recently approved uh, Gratola Court subdivision on the east side of Montrose Road. We don't believe that the zoning standards will have a measurable impact on the surrounding properties. Now the region is concerned about uh, vehicles backing onto Montrose Road uh, because that road experience is higher than average speeds. And some of you may recall that the city has uh, maximum driveway width provisions in the zoning bylaw. And the region would prefer that uh, wider driveways would be allowed to accommodate vehicles turning around and facing traffic as they leave. And we believe that uh, making an adjustment to that standard is reasonable in the interest of public safety. So whereas uh, the standard provisions would allow uh, a maximum of 60% of the lot frontage to be driveway or 7.6 meters in this and uh, we're recommending that it be increased to 75% or uh, 9.3 meters as was illustrated on that uh, plan that illustrated the proposed houses. So this is uh, an illustration of one of several properties on Stanley Avenue, north of Mountain Road, if you're familiar with that area. Um, the same concern was expressed at the time those parcels were approved and we made allowances, or council I should say, made allowances for these turnarounds. And uh, each one of those properties has uh, taken advantage of that to provide a space to, to turn around. Uh, in, in the illustration, on the screen, you can notice that they are actually parking there. Um, but the intent is to provide a, a means of, of turning around on the property and facing traffic as they're leaving. So we're recommending that the application be approved. It complies with provincial and regional policies. We believe it represents an efficient use of urban and service land and existing infrastructure. And it's going to help us reach our uh, intensification targets, uh, albeit in a minor way. The lands are designated for residential purposes. They're zoned for single family purposes now. Uh, it's just an alternative form, uh, two homes instead of one. Uh, the in existing infrastructure can support the proposed development. And uh, like I said, we, uh, we believe allowing wider driveways are appropriate in the interest of uh, ensuring public safety. So. Having said that, uh, we uh, recommend that the requested zoning amendment uh, be approved by council as uh, reported in our report and subject to the regulations as, uh, as I outlined. Thank you, Mr. Mech. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Mech? Okay, thank you.
Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Municipal Board. Or is that who it is now? Let's update these, don't we? No, we didn't. It's now the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal. Will result in the Local Appeal Planning Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheet will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from, any, uh, from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to address council. Is there anyone here who wishes to address council on this issue other than the applicant? Okay, then council will hear from the applicant and his or her representative. So if you'd like to come forward to the microphone. Good evening, Good evening. Worship, Council. Um, I like the positive feedback. I think the proposal suits a lot of the needs of the city. Um, Can we get your name, please? Oh, sorry, Fernando Pasquale. Okay. My my wife and I, Angela, own the property. Okay. Um, the only issue we've had right from the beginning, and I mean, I'll go with it, but that turnabout seems to be an issue. Are These, you in favor of this? Or Absolutely. Oh, you're the applicant. Yes. Yeah. I oh, am. yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I am. I mean, I am in favor of it. Uh, the only thing is with those turnabouts, we get. We, you know, you can like you saw the other houses. You're going to get a lot of concrete there. It can. It's doable, but um, there was an example up the road on Montrose Road, uh, just south of uh, Thorstone or uh, Blundy's Lane. They put two semis there, and they're fairly new. They have both double driveways side by each, which the region actually proposed originally. Um, they have three cars back to back. So there's six cars parked in those driveways. There's absolutely no way those cars are gonna turn around in those driveways. So if we did the same thing here and went with two driveways side by each, you get two cars parked behind each other and two beside, you're not gonna turn around. So. We will do this um, if we have to. I'm not in agreement with it. Uh, speed limit there is 60 kilometers an hour. Yes, uh, a lot of us don't follow the speed limit, but um, Montrose Road south of us has the same issue. And um, they're not, I have pictures of all the cars parked there. They're not gonna be able to turn around in those driveways. And there are two double driveways side by each. So I would have preferred just double driveways for the double garages on each house. These houses are gonna be substantial. They're gonna be two story, probably around 3,000 square feet. Uh, it'd be nice to have a little bit more grass in the front yard rather than concrete. That's the only comments I have. Do we have questions of council uh, for Pasqual? Yes, Council Peter Angel. Yeah, Your Worship, I know that the region is uh, uh, suggesting that that be part of the recommendation. Is there anything that uh, obligates the city to adopt those recommendations or can we adopt our own? Mr. Meg? I think council is free to make the decision that they think is the best one. Okay. The other thing I'd point out is it's not a requirement, it, it's an option. Oh, so they don't have to? Well, what we were proposing to include the bylaw was a wider driveway op opportunity. I mean, is the region gonna, I don't think the region's gonna stand there and police the matter, but they, they're, they're looking to, you know, address the issue as best that can be addressed. So, it's, it, but it, the decision rests with council. Okay, so we have our answer. Any, any other questions before I close the public meeting? I, I like the uh, grass area. I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. like that. <coughs> well, we can give them the option, right? So, yeah. Yeah. so is there any other issues other than the parking issue? No. No, okay. All right, that's great. Well, thanks very much. I'm gonna, uh, let me just close. The public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Uh, yes, Councillor Pimentel. Yeah, I would just simply um, move the motion to uh, approve the recommendation. And I don't think I would add in your worship the, uh, uh, the recommendation that there has to be that turnaround. I think whoever you know purchases the home or builds the home, that's gonna be their choice to do that whether or not they wish, but I don't think it should be part of the recommendation, so I'd make that a group. Okay. Yeah, I'll second it. I think I was the, the mover. <laughs> no, you didn't speak up. Huh? You didn't speak up. Yes, I did. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you very much. You two can ar ar arm wrestle in the back room when we're done here. Uh, yes, Mr. Mike. I just need to have clarity. 
Are we making the opportunity for them to do it if they choose to? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to make it optional for you. Okay. So you can do it if you choose to, and if you choose not to, and you want more green area, which is nice as well, you have that option. I just want to be sure because I think somewhere in one of the reports it said that the region would not allow us access to the road if we didn't abide by their recommendation. Take, that just with, take it up with the region. It's their road. Can they act? Can they? Uh, I think that's why I just asked whether or not it had to be part of the motion. Do we have to adhere to what they're asking or not? Right. So, do we need any clarity on that? Uh, it's kind of an interesting point, but council can pass the rules that it wants, and the region can make the rules that it wants relative to the road. So, um, the idea, as I'm hearing it, is to leave the option open, and then that would um, further negotiation with the region might result in. A different configuration than you're seeing but council doesn't have to do what the region says okay so we're going to leave it in there as an option okay. and if you need more representation the region will help you there as well great thank you so you've heard the motion uh you heard the second which could have almost been the motion you heard that debate as well we'll call the vote we all know, those in favor we know where your favorite <laughs> is. <laughs> he's got a record tonight i mean what are, how many in a row five in a row it was amazing it's an amazing night. Thanks Thank very you. much, gentlemen. Thank you. It's a big night. It's a big night for Councillor Peter Angelo. Okay. Um, I would now ask our acting clerk to introduce the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit. Uh, the expansion of the existing Chevrolet car dealership at 5888 Thoroughstone Road and portion of 5900 Thoroughstone Road. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with regulations on Friday, March 23rd, 2018. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, here we go, here we are. Now I'll ask our acting director of planning, Mr. Mack, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Briefly. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here but us for it. <laughs> We've read it. <laughs> All right, uh, your worship and members of council, uh, as you've heard, this is a zoning amendment application for 5588 and 5900 Thoroughstone Road. Back in January of this year, the Committee of Adjustment approved the consent application to sever the easterly portion of 5900 uh, Thoroughstone Road and to merge it with uh, 5888. I'm not sure if that address is actually correct. I'm, I apologize for that. But it's uh, basically to sever the southern half of the land illustrated in red and from the lands to the uh, west and to add it to the uh, car dealership site. The north half of the land is currently zoned light industrial and the lands that are being added are zoned general industrial. Uh, the issue is that the general industrial zone does not permit a new car agency. So the applicant's requesting that the whole of the land be placed under a new site-specific light industrial zone that would allow that use to be expanded onto the lands that they are acquiring. And the uh, site-specific uh, zoning would also recognize uh, several variances that, that have been allowed in the past. Uh, one more recently uh, for the rear yard setback to recognize uh, the, the position of the existing uh, warehouse style building on the property uh, and its position to the southerly property line and also to carry forward uh, an adjustment to the landscaping uh, requirement uh, that was made for the, uh, the site along its frontage on Thoroughstone Road. So to keep this brief, there was an open house. Uh, no property owners in the area attended the site. Uh, so there's seems to be uh, agreement on this change. It, there's not really going to be any uh, noticeable change in, in how the site is, is uh, used. 
other than there be additional vehicles parked on the property. We don't see any issue with it from an official plan perspective, a provincial policy perspective. Uh, we don't anticipate any land use conflicts. Um, I'll just uh, highlight that back in uh, 1998, council changed the front half of the property from general industrial to light industrial to allow the dealership to be established there. And um, so this use um, is successful and uh, you know, gives a good impression as you enter the city with uh, Thorldstone Road being a gateway. And uh, we're happy to see this viable business expand. And so we're recommending that uh, council uh, agree, agree with this change. Okay. Any questions from council for Mr. Meck? Mem members of the public are advised that their failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal <coughs> dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheet will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative to give a very brief uh, presentation. It's a race. Who's going to get there first? Me. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you very much uh, for seeing us tonight. My name is Robert Martin. Uh, I'm the agent for uh, Lantana Holdings and uh, the owners of the present owners of the property, uh, Thorstone uh, Properties. Uh, Mr. Meck has given an excellent report tonight. Uh, we don't uh, we don't have any objection to that. We I would be pleased to give council uh, a little bit of history on the on the area there. Uh, you know that uh, in 19, uh, 2003, uh, Falshev opened their dealership there, and uh, since then uh, they've been an excellent uh, business. Uh, their business has basically doubled, and uh, for the last three years, uh, Mr. Cullen who's here tonight, if you need to ask any questions, uh, has been uh, uh, renting space from Thorstone Properties on the building behind which we are uh, wish to uh, merge with uh, their present property for parking. Right now, uh, there's enough, there isn't enough space with inventory and their employees uh, to park on the site. And for the last three years, they've been parking across the street in front of the Ohio Brass Building and uh, having to cross Thorldstone Road uh, to get to work. So uh, uh, we are uh, pleased to be able to present this to council tonight. And if there are any questions, uh, our planner here, Mr. Brady, is here if there's any planning issues. And Mr. Cullen, uh, senior, he's here tonight if there's any questions regarding uh, Fall Chef. Okay, that's great. Do we have any questions of council? Close the it looks like we're good to go. Thank you very much, Mr. Brady. That was well said. Thank, Thank you for being there. I was brief. <laughs> you were more brief. Definitely more brief. The public, <laughs> the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Don't move, Your Worship. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Crater. All those in favor? And that's approved. Thank you for that. Well done. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll now ask our acting clerk to introduce the next item on the agenda. Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed plan of vacant land condominium at 7712 Badger Road in Niagara Falls. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the regulations on Friday, March 23rd, 2018. Anyone who wants notice of council's decision shall leave their name on the sign in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you very much. Now I'll ask our acting director of planning, Mr. Mack, to explain the purpose of the application. Your worship members of council, um, this application is for a vacant land condominium. It's the process by which the land uh, is divided into units of land. And uh, following that, uh, 
the developer typically builds uh, the land use that's allowed on the property. In this case, uh, 15 townhouse dwelling units with a common uh, private road, visitor parking, and amenity areas. <coughs> so the property is just over half a hectare in size. And uh, this uh, picture illustrates the, the view of the property uh, as you would enter the site uh, looking south. The subject property is at 7712 Badger Road, and uh, this is uh, several houses uh, west of, of the intersection of Badger and Montrose Road. So un unlike uh, a plaza, where we would put a project through site plan, uh, we, we address those very site development issues uh, through the condominium process. Uh, so issues such as site grading, landscaping, lighting, fencing, waste disposal are uh, addressed in a condominium agreement rather than a site plan agreement. The uh, recommended, uh, recommended conditions of our approval are included in Appendix A of our report. Uh, there's nothing uh, unusual there, uh, and it's very common uh, to other projects of this uh, type. This tile just il illustrates uh, the location of the property. There has been some land assembly uh, through consent in the past. Uh, the site is surrounded by single detached dwellings on, on all sides that backs onto a hydro corridor. Next tile. This uh, plan illustrates how the uh, townhouse units will be configured. So again, as I mentioned with the earlier application, the, the, the province is requiring us to be better stewards of our land and resources, and we have intensification targets that we have to meet. Uh, this development will assist the city in achieving those uh, density targets. The lands are designated residential. There's really no uh, land use issue per se. Uh, you could actually flip to the next tile. The, uh, the zoning's already in place. It's, uh, um, it's established as R4 with a holding provision. And that holding provision requires the completion of a noise study and the filing of a record of site condition uh, prior to development just because of some of the activities that have occurred on the site in the past. Last year, the Committee of Adjustment uh, granted a minor variance to reduce the uh, lot area requirement, and that enabled uh, the developer to provide one additional dwelling unit. There were some inefficiencies in the uh, original design, and uh, so they've taken advantage of that. A noise study was submitted, and it indicates that noise from the QEW and, and Montrose Road are within acceptable limits. and. Uh, the other aspect of the holding provision that's in play is the completion of a record of site condition and that will have to be uh, addressed by the applicant in due course and will be a condition of approval. So in conclusion, uh, we're recommending the, the division of the land uh, by this condominium. It's going to uh, provide additional housing choices in this uh, part of the city. It's going to contribute to our uh, short-term housing supply. And uh, the conditions, as I said, in Appendix A are, are fairly standard. They deal with fencing, uh, grading, lighting, landscaping, um, as you would typically uh, expect staff to do uh, at, in approving a site plan. But in this case, the conditions are put forward to council to approve. And then staff will review those various conditions as the developer moves through the approval process. And then uh, approval will be granted. Uh, once all the conditions are met. So we're recommending uh, that Council approve the, the application for vacant land condominium subject to the conditions in Appendix A that the Mayor or designate be authorized to sign the draft plan as approved 20 days after the notice of Council's decision and that draft approval be given for three years. That's our standard uh, term that we give for developers to meet those conditions, typically they are able to do that uh, quicker than that, given the market conditions. 
and then we're just seeking uh, approval for the mayor and clerk to be authorized to ex uh, execute the agreement uh, when we're at that stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you much. Any questions of council for Mr. Mech? Okay, seeing none. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the, do you have the sheet of paper there? Uh, oh, here it is, I found it, Never mind. Will result into the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives if the party has not made an oral or written submission at this public meeting. Council now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the draft plan of vacant land condominium. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Yes, okay, if you'd like to come forward to the microphone, you just state your name and your address, please. My name is Marion Girardin. I live at 7781 Badger Road, just a few houses down from that. You speak of this townhouse set up the land seems to be fitting for uh, 15 units. You've not addressed the impact that it would have on Badger Road itself. That road is so extremely busy to begin with. It's not a very big road. It's not a very long road. There's quite a few houses on it already. What impact is 15 townhouses full of people and cars going to have on this short street? My son was hit um, a week and a half ago. Um, as he parked on the street for 20 minutes and was hit. There's been a multitude of minor accidents on that street already. Uh, how can you possibly have that many more cars coming in and out of a short street like that? Have you measured the length of Badger Road? And has there been some kind of a study done on the impact that that would have? Okay. And I think there should be. Okay, let me get you some answers. So we'll start by going to our uh, traffic engineer, uh, Matthew Billado. Maybe you can address some of the traffic concerns. Yeah, of course. So, so we would expect to see a minimum minimal amount of traffic with 15 units uh, throughout the day. We estimated probably around 150 trips. So it's usually around 10 vehicle trips per unit per day, and that's divided up uh, for 24 hours. Uh, to date, we haven't received any formal complaints about Badger Road in terms of speed or excessive volume on the road. That's something we can definitely follow up if that's a concern to you. Mm -hmm. It is, and what 10 vehicles are you talking about when there's 15 units? And you're saying that many people have two cars in there. Yeah, so, so with any type of development, if it's say if it's a single unit, we would expect that single unit to generate around 10 vehicle trips per day. So that could be folks going to and from work, going to run errands. So if there's 15 units associated with this development, we can you know estimate that there would be probably approximately 150 additional trips on Badger Road in a 24-hour period. Okay, thank you. There's been a noise study done as per the QEW. Has there been a noise study done as to what 15 units will do to this small area? The noise from the people? People, in? generally. I don't know if that's, uh, do we do usually do studies for things like that, Mr. Mack? Yeah. People? Yeah. Not people. Usually the issue is vehicular movements. So you're putting a lot of people into a small area. And there's neighbors around there. Your Worship, I'd like to rem remind Council that this zoning has been in place. It's the, like the land use is established um, by bylaw. And as well, the Committee of Adjustment has approved an additional unit uh, through that process. So, um, you know, I can't speak to the traffic matters per se as, as, as my colleague here, but we circulated the application as we normally do uh, to various departments to input on these matters and I'm not aware of a traffic if issue ever being reported. So uh, what's before council tonight is, is simply the division of the land and how the, the site itself will develop. If there's a, you know, a traffic issue that's being reported, then I, I would suggest that that's something that staff could investigate and perhaps report back to council. But in terms of this application, the, the land use is already established. It's just a matter of you know, the applicant wishes to divide the land so that the individual units can be sold. Okay. Thank you. So, so there's, to okay. answer your question, there's not a specific noise study for people per se, and the land use, as he's saying, it's been in place for a while. So, um, and, and if there is a traffic issue there, it's a matter of just letting us know, and our staff can initiate a study and follow up on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Councilor Peter Angelo. 
Well, that's what I was going to suggest, Your Worship, is that staff are always doing studies of different areas when residents call and say that there's an issue with traffic. And, you know, if after the approval of this or after the construction of this, then there is a traffic problem on Badger Road, then residents are always willing to call one of us or simply call uh, Mr. Billado or his staff, uh, and they will go there. They'll do a study, and then a lot of times what happens is they end up putting different calming measures in place so that cars can't speed down the road. Um, but as Mr. Mech has already said, uh, the zoning on the land is already in place, uh, and it's not something that we can take away from the landowner. Is there anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Okay, seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Good evening, your worship, city staff and councillors. Uh, so basically, my name is Lucy Borghese. I'm here on behalf of the developers of this, devel of this uh, site at 7712 Badger. Basically here to support the application and seek approval for a draft plan condominium. And if you have any questions <coughs> that I can answer, I'm here. Uh, but, you know, pretty much we agree to uh, respect the all the conditions on Appendix A to conform to the development of the project. Um, other than that, okay. Do we have any questions for Ms. Borghese? Okay. It looks like we're. Oh, we do have a question. Yes, Councilor yeah, Pierre. Yeah, through you to uh, Ms. Borghese. Uh, welcome. Um, I, I guess my only question for the residents' benefit would be that this is a plan of condominium, so um, there would be a condo corporation that would be attached to the Vacant land condominium, sorry. Yep. And every uh, person that owns a unit there would have to uh, pay a common fee that Correct. would go into the maintenance of the property so that uh, none of the units there would be able to, uh, I guess, uh, deteriorate in, in That's their correct. appearance or, or anything else. Okay. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. There's no further questions. The public meeting with respect to the proposed draft plan of vacant land condominium is now concluded. What's the will of council? Move forward. <laughs> <laughs> Motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Campbell, the two Waynes. There's no further comments. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that's approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Bylaws? Are we under bylaws? Okay, we're on the bylaws. A motion to give the bylaws a first reading. Your motion by Councillor Peter Angelo to give the bylaws a first reading. Seconded by Councillor Cario. Yes, Councillor. Yes, I would like to speak to um, the bylaw of uh, 2018-43. Okay. So we'll just hold that motion while Councillor Strange talks to a bylaw. Should be an interesting conversation. Which one was I'm that again? Yeah. I'm sorry. Councillor Valpati liked that one. At least somebody got it. <laughs> what was that? I'm sorry, what can you that was twenty eighteen? Dash forty three. Okay. All right. All right, the floor is yours, Councillor. Okay. Um we got the I guess the mandate from the province that they wanted to create um, uh, secondary dwelling units and it, and it was because um, of, I guess, low-income housing and, and having places where people uh, could rent and uh, getting places uh, available, um, which we obviously have a problem in the city. Um, so it came up that we wanted an one, one of the dwellings to be owner-occupied. The following meeting, we had the discussions about Airbnbs, which are basically uh, tourist dwellings, or they're, they're renting to tourists. And it came up to the motion of having uh, mandatory a um, uh, owner occupied or management or relative. I believe it was it was something to that. So to to see you know something that's long term rental and we need this in our city for low low income housing. I would either like to see uh, and and maybe ask for a friendly amendment either to remove the uh, the owner occupied because we're basically making another unit available for some low-income housing or to have the same um, uh, basically 
you know, have a, a management company or a relative or something, the same as the Airbnb we're, we're, we're entitled to. I don't know if anyone at council, um, if we can have a discussion about this or if anybody would be interested in making an amendment. Um, I, I think at, at least I think we should add uh, to the Airbnb, the same as the Airbnbs where they were allowed to have a man, I believe it was a management company, uh, a relative that's staying in one of the units. Mr. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we actually, the, what I actually understood you wanted <laughs> was that there'd be at least a tenant uh, be the person that would be in charge of the, the bed and breakfast. Um, if we're going to change the idea of the owner, uh, then this whole bylaw is done. Like it has to be completely redone. Okay, because it's set up entirely. I structured the whole thing to go around that idea of the owner being in one of the two units. Because the rationale, one of the reasons, if I'm, if I was dealing with an appeal, one of the important things that I would be arguing is that this creates, uh, helps uh, the two, two of the things that came up during council's discussions. One was letting young people start to buy houses because they could, they could use the income from the second unit to support their, their family house. And then the idea of keeping uh, seniors in the same neighborhood that, they, that they've been familiar with. In that scenario, you'd be thinking of them moving into the smaller one and then renting out the bigger one. But they could still go to the same church and so on. That was, that's all been put into what I call the recitals of, the, of this bylaw. So this bylaw was specifically designed to deal with, it, with anybody who wanted to challenge council's desire to have an owner in one of the other units. So if we're not going to have that, then the whole thing has to be redone. Well, I just think that the initial, because when it came with the initial recommendation, it wasn't to have it owner occupied, was it? We made an, that a, that a friendly well, that, amendment. That's to right, it. but that's what council passed, so yes. that's what we made the bylaw. Well, I, I know, and, and I agree. It's just when yeah. we when we the Airbnb came up, and now you know. Well, see, the Airbnb. I didn't think anybody was talking about relatives and so on and management companies unless the person was there. See, that was the whole idea. Was when you were talking manager, the manager was on site. He yeah. was there. That's what made it a bed and breakfast. Not some guy who tr trots around and visits because then there's then there's no distinction between a, uh, a bed and breakfast and and a, uh, a traditional you know a simple short-term vacation rental the whole di distinction between the two is the what i used to say when we were talking about in, is the owners in the store and that was the idea to have somebody on site to control the behavior that was the theory behind as i understood it, the distinction that council was making between a bed and breakfast and what they continued to what council's continued to forbid which is the short-term vacation rental unit which is where the owner's not there so that's what i understood the distinctions were here, I heard, and I thought it was it was a, it was a good idea, from the, or at least, I should uh, not my comment to comment, it's a good idea, but from, from the point of view of defending the bylaw, it was a great idea, the idea that, the, that this would be a mechanism to allow younger people to get started in the home ownership uh, uh, trend. And that's pretty good. There are an awful lot of people buying houses outside of Niagara Falls that I'm encountering in the bylaw enforcement area. Um, and it, you know, I, I would, if I was sitting in your, your Chair, be concerned about our younger people not being able to stay here. I thought that was part of what I was hearing and when council was discussing this, you know, and, and that, that would enable the younger people to have this, this thing to buy. And I wanted to hear, but in Thunder Bay, that was a really standard way of buying a house when I was, when I was there. You bought the house and you put in a room and you rented it to a Broxton. And that was how the young people bought their houses. And I saw the same pattern developing here and I thought, wow, I can defend that in front of the OMB big time. Then, so I thought it was great. And then this idea of the seniors, this came out around us, the seniors staying in the same neighborhood. So that's what this bylaw is designed to do. If that's not what council wants, you know, if you want to fix it, then we'll have to just pull it and start again because it, there would be a, a big change from what I've proposed here. It's council's decision. I'm not saying yeah, no, I, yes. I just think it was a problem way of trying process. to accommodate people who can't yes. afford housing. Yes. So they started these dwelling units. Um, and I don't think any other, I don't know if any other municipality is saying that you have to be owner occupied, but I would like to, you know, if you're having, I remember Councilor Crater saying, you know, we just, we, we just added that many more uh, dwellings to help, uh, help the, uh, the people that can't afford a house and, and they can afford to, to rent. And uh, if we did this, we could kind of double it up. That's what I was thinking by not having an owner occupied. Um. Okay, um, so why don't we, I've got Councillor Carey okay. up next, Go and we'll ahead. address yep. it. Well, Your Worship, um, I was prepared to support it either way, uh, whether or not the owner was owner-occupied or not. I was prepared to support it, so uh, I'd like to hear what some of the other councillors have to say, but I would still support it, even if we had to go back to the drawing board. I wasn't, I didn't vote for it because I thought an owner had to be there. Okay, uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, I wouldn't support 
uh, the owner not being there, I thought the intent truly was that uh, it was going to make affordable housing available to people that couldn't afford to buy a house or keep other older individuals who can't afford to stay in the house financially to have a few dollars income. Am I right, uh, Mr. Beeman? Well, that's that was the rationale that, yeah, that's I, I, that I adopted in the bylaw, yeah. but that doesn't, you know, but if I'm it, guessing at what council wants, I remember too, when I do this, I'm trying to guess, you know, because you're a legislative body, different people for different, for different motives, but this bylaw was designed for that rationale. If that isn't, uh, so what, 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 what happens here is uh, someone's got a few extra bucks to, uh, to spend on housing, uh, goes out and buys up all these units and rents them all out. And um, there's uh, no, I'm telling you right now, uh, they're not going to rent it out for the same amount of money that a, a couple would rent <laughs> out their basement apartment or a room in their house to make that extra 500 bucks a month. They're going to rent it out to the, somebody over here for twelve hundred bucks a month, and somebody over here in the other part of the house for nine hundred bucks a month. Like it's not going to address affordable housing if we do not leave the owner-occupied condition there. That was the whole intent, as far as I was concerned. Okay, uh, I've got Councilor Cario in Morocco. Well, that's one opinion, but anyway, um, the, the question I had was. Um, so what happens, you have an owner occupied after we pass this bylaw, owner occupied, rents out the space, then the owner either goes away or wants to sell, and the next person that comes along just wants to buy the house. So does that mean that person can only sell the house to someone who wants to live there and rent, the, rent it out the way it was? Or can they sell it to anybody? Or what happens? Well, Very the confusing person who's after. buying would live there. The person who was buying would have to have the expectation have to, to live, live there? Yeah, to keep, no, So you couldn't buy the house, house then unless you lived there? Yes, that, that, that would be the idea. Uh, if you want to keep the unit though. You see, if, if you take the unit out, then you don't have a problem. You can rent the whole house. But you have to either do one or the other. You have to live in that house? Yes, that's the way this Well, good luck. Well, you think you don't have enough bylaw officers now. Good luck <laughs> with that one. Oh, but, uh, well, but these kinds of restrictions are very frequently adopted in, in municipalities and uh, for an example is Prince Edward Island, which has restrictions on who can own land because otherwise the province would be owned all by, yeah, by no people who don't live there. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just using that, and there are, there are similar situations. British Columbia has an awful lot of problems with absentee owners. Yeah. You end up with a, with a municipality where the people that vote for you are vassals of, of, of people from larger municipalities that have more money. That's, that's the challenge which if we don't face it in this bylaw, we'll be faced in another one because of the amount of of uh, outside ownership that is graduate that is being attracted to Niagara Falls. So, but it, it is it is definitely it's a complex thing to enforce. I acknowledge that. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I I do think there's a rationale for doing it, which is supportable if we're challenged on planning principles. But if council doesn't want to do that, again, you're the councilors. I'm. But we'll just draft what you need. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Morocco. Yeah, just a, just a comment. You know, I think the real elephant in the room is basically the Landlord and Tenants Act. I can't tell you how many times in one month I'll get a call from somebody that's actually renting a house or part of their house to someone. Actually, it's not really part of their house, but they're a house to someone that they have not paid the rent. And how can we get them out? They're three months behind, and these are some of these seniors that actually have another house and that they can't afford to come up with the money to pay the bills and utilities from somebody living there. So I think there's a real problem with the Landlord and Tenant Acts and it's actually causing this because people are going, why do I want to rent anymore to people that I can't get out and I have nobody there to help me with a Landlord and Tenant Act? So you know what they're doing? They're all turning to uh, renting out this uh, short-term vacation rental. It's making them more money and it's less grief. So I think that the province needs to look at the Landlord and Tenant Act to try and help these people when they have tenants that uh, won't leave and there's nothing they can do. I guess uh, part of my part, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around here and, and I appreciate where you're coming from is, so if I buy a house, I can rent the whole house out to anybody, no problem. But if I have two units in the house, I, ca I have to live in one now. I don't know. I don't know how we would police that. Man, I don't even have an idea how you do that. Yes, Councillor Kent. No, Your Worship. I uh, I have rental units. 
And uh, what you're saying there, I, uh, I can I'm just understand the confusion. Uh, there's a difference between me buying a house that's got separate, three separate apartments in it, and renting them all out, as opposed to me having to uh, live in one apartment. This bylaw is for those present <coughs> possible accommodations that are not legal. For example, I have, with my family moving out, I live in a really big house. I could have at the front part of my house uh, turned into uh, something that would be uh, inexpensive to rent. And it could be for people with low cost housing problems. But I can't do that right now. Can I? It's against the law. It's against our bylaws. I can't separate uh, my front bedroom and, and uh, washroom from the rest of my house and, and rent that out unless it's to a member of my family. That's how I understand the bylaw. Mr. Beamer? Assuming that you're in a zone that requires, that has a single detached, well, I'll call it single detached zone, one unit, you would not be allowed to have two. Right. Two units. But it wouldn't matter who you but, but this bylaw will allow that to happen. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. That's the idea is to allow current single detached dwelling zone land to have another unit in it. That will make them different from existing, say, duplexes and existing triplexes and existing um, semi detached dwellings, which are zoned for that purpose. And then it's because this new land use is being developed that this idea of you know, having the owner in one unit is being. Is a possible regulatory requirement. Um, I would add there are other municipalities that have done this, have required that. So we're not the only one that's, that has thought of the idea. Um, and it's just simply a matter of whether council wants it or not. If council doesn't want it, we'll just draft up a bylaw different. Our CAO is going to weigh just, in. Just one sure. point. I, I'm not sure if Mr. Beeman addressed it or not, but we had informed council, I think the last meeting, that we were expecting regulation to come down from the province. Let me address this issue. That regulation is not forthcoming. So if council were to pass this bylaw tonight, uh, which would mean the owner occupation, at some time in the future, if the province comes down with the regulation, we would need to readdress it at that point anyway, and Mr. Beeman could report on it at that time. Council Chair. Uh, well, just a, another question to our solicitor. Is this the common way that people are doing it, or this, is this an unusual way? Or is this the minority of the towns doing it this way? It's so common that the province passed the regulation because they were want threatened to pass the regulation because they didn't like it. They didn't like it. No. So they don't because like it, so it yeah. could be changed they're, by them they're, regardless. They're, I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. But they, I doubt very much, at least, unless the new government, uh, I'm anticipating, at least at the moment, it doesn't look like we're going to have the same government. If we don't get the same government, that regulation is toast. <laughs> <laughs> but even, even, assuming the new even assuming the same government gets reelected, um, they haven't shown any enthusiasm for bringing the regulation forward when they're under the scrutiny of the voters. Okay, so we have a couple of choices here. Uh, one is we can refer this uh, bylaw out uh, for staff to recraft, or we can pass this bylaw. So it's up to council to make a decision on this specific bylaw. We have a motion for the bylaws yet? Uh, we do for all the bylaws, but, uh, but we would pull this one. So we can make the first motion. Like, like sorry. So, like the CEO said, it, it will be coming back most likely from the province. It, no. if, if at such time as the province decides to pass a regulation, mm -hmm. we would bring it back to you. At this point in time, we have no indication when that regulation may be coming forward. Mm -hmm. I would move 2018-43. Okay. Do we have a seconder to move that Second. bylaw? Second by Councillor Thompson. Do we have any discussion further on this? We'll call the vote on that. All those in favor of that bylaw? One. <laughs> okay, that gets approved. Okay, that's uh, for a first reading. Opposed? No? Okay. Um, and then how about the remainder of the bylaws then on the first reading? Well, we already had that motion. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Let's just point out that bylaws 2018-41 now through to 2018-47 have been read a first time. Second. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, a second by Councillor Carey would give the bylaws a second and third reading. All those in favor? That's approved. 
And bylaws 2018-41 through 2018-47, read a second, third time, and passed. Do we have any other new business we haven't covered yet? No, we don't have any? Oh, <laughs> Councillor Peter Angelo, he didn't have a chance yet. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I'm sorry, um, Councillor Morocco, we've got a... Oh, did Councillor Morocco have something? No, she was on her oh, way out okay. the door, but that's okay, oh, she I came see. back. She came back. Um, yeah, Your Worship, I wanted to mention an item, but... Uh, I mean, I've already mentioned it before, and I guess uh, subliminally, I don't want it to be like, um, you know, that BNF logo, where it just keeps getting mentioned, uh, but doesn't get any traction. Tracks, the train tracks So, again. yeah, okay. Uh, but um, uh, I wanted to know where we were with asking the region to have the 405 as fully functional. I still believe that from a city standpoint, it makes so much sense for us to get all of those commercial vehicles off of our roads especially the ones that are headed out to the 405 in Stanley and have to cross our city every single time because to they go have- To go 40 rebound. Because they have no access to the Queen Elizabeth So Way. I can address that one. Yeah, well you used to live just backing onto Mountain Road and that would be one of the streets that they would, that they would be coming down. And no matter how slow they're going, uh, they make a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And I think to have the 405 fully functional so that you can catch it no matter which direction you're going in, um, in 20 years time, we'll be wondering why we never did it before. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that the time is now to really start the process. And I think we need to either find out whether or not the region has uh, started the process, or we need to endorse a resolution onto the region. Okay, and if that's the way to do it, then, then I'd be happy to make that motion. Because I really think that, again, like I said, in 20 years time, we'll be looking back wondering why we never did it sooner. Agreed. So I'll give you a quick update on, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, oh, maybe Matthew's got an update. Uh, Matthew, do you have an update on uh, on this issue for Councillor Peter Angela? Uh, very brief, I know it's included in the region's transportation council plan. So something I can follow up and provide some additional information to you on that one. Okay, I was just wondering um, on that issue. whether or not the 405 being fully functional was included in their transportation master plan or if it had to do with just addressing the access at Glendale Avenue. Because um, from what I read in the paper, I thought it was just simply the access at Glendale Avenue. What I'm talking about more is if you're headed northbound on the Queen Elizabeth Way and you pass Mountain Road, you should be able to go off onto the 405. Um, if you're coming from the 405, and you're headed westbound, you should be able to access the Queen Elizabeth Way south. And you can't do that right now. It, 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 it's not fully functional. If you're coming down the 405 uh, from the bridge westbound, you have to go north into St. Catharines. If you then want to turn around at Glendale Avenue, you can. So the whole intersection itself is not fully functional yet. And it sounds like I'm getting traction, which makes me feel good, so it's not like BNF. You should say fully functional one more time though, I think. <laughs> Mr. So, so if I can just, uh, on this topic, so we just had the Ministry of Transportation in at the region's public works meeting about a month ago, and I brought that exact topic up because I know how near and dear it is to your heart. You're and Well, yeah, so, so we're talking about the redesign of Glendale Interchange, and they're talking about this new concept, the double diamond uh, concept, and they're, they're trying to figure out the best configuration and I said one of the problems is it's not a fully functional 405. So in other words, if you come from Queen St. Lewiston Bridge and you want to go toward Fort Erie, you got to cut through the city. There's no way, or you go to Glendale, you get off, you, you do the loop, you ask them for directions and you come back the other way. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And conversely, coming the other way, you can't get onto it without cutting through the city. Right. So the region solution is to use Mewburn Road no. and connect with line six. That's what their plan is. No. And so I brought up with the Ministry of Transportation the idea of, as you say, a fully functional 405 where you wouldn't have to come through the city. So they made note of that, but I think an official resolution from this council to the region and the MTO would be a, probably a good idea to make it official. So yes, Councillor Peter Angel. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. And I, I wouldn't be in support of using Line 6 and Mewburn Road as an access way from the 405 That's the uh, up to Mountain Road and then over to the Queen Elizabeth Way. Um, I mean, anyone who's traveled that road lately, and I know maybe people don't get there because the bridge has actually been closed for a couple of years. You but anyone, it. we usually run it, yeah. yeah. So, and, but anyone that goes along that stretch will tell you that the, the road is quite narrow at that point. To think that you're going to get uh, large trucks or even uh, a heavy amount of vehicles 
up and down that road, uh, you'd, you'd really have to cut into the escarpment. Uh, you'd really be doing some, some damage there. And I really don't think the people along there would appreciate the traffic either. I think we have highways. We need to use our highways to the best of their abilities. And right now, we're not doing that. So that would be the plan that I would put forward. So do you want to make a motion? Absolutely, Your Worship. So we've got a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Crater, that the city put forward an official resolution requ requesting that the province, full yeah, the province and the region support a full functioning 405, um, rather than, as you say, yes. forcing traffic through the city of Niagara Falls, including since that bridge is largely commercial, commercial vehicles, transport trucks, etc., through the city. As, okay, so we more or less have that uh, motion. Any questions to the motion? We'll call that vote. All those in favor for a fully functional 405? Okay, and that's approved. BNF. Councillor Campbell. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. One quick question through you to staff. Uh, I've had a few complaints of uh, skunks, especially in the downtown area. Uh, how can uh, it be dealt with? Is there a humane society that I should be recommending that the uh, people complain and call or is it skunk you're smelling for I, oh, I, 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 I've actually seen one skunk. Because I, I, marijuana I, I know and the skunk are all the difference confused. between the skunk weed and the skunk okay. itself. Okay. Okay. Make <laughs> and sure. I did see, uh, but I have seen a skunk. And there's been a couple of skunks on my street, Army Street. And uh, I don't know who to call. I would, who would, who would, I would recommend Humane Society for that. Humane Society? Yeah, we're, we don't have any idea what to do with the skunk. Okay. What's that? Yeah, or exterminator, sure, yeah. Any other new business? Okay, it, oh, Councilor Morocco? Oh, motion to adjourn, Council Morocco, second by Councilor Campbell. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Here's your reminder.